said, uh, just said my dissertation was about the early 17th century, and this is about the 18th century. It's not that many years, but it feels like a very large gap. So I'm kind of in foreign territory here, and I often feel like I don't, don't know of many texts as well as some other people might. Um, uh, trying a approach um, based on a problem in Leibniz um, that I'm tracing through the head very good. And we'll see that, that, that um, many of the quotes that I'm uh, looking at here are quotes that, especially in Joe's talk, we have already seen. Maybe I can take that as an opportunity to look at them more closely. So, in Chatelet, in, in the labyrinth of the continuum, what's the labyrinth of the continuum? It's uh, one of the two labyrinths that uh, Leibniz always used to denote what he saw as the two most difficult and most important problems in his philosophy. And there's only um, the first labyrinth is the moral labyrinth, and a prominent statement of the two labyrinths is in the introduction to the theodicy, which is about this moral labyrinth, as everybody knows, I expect, uh, not just the justification of evil in the world, but the explanation of contingency more generally. Hmm. And the other labyrinth is the discussion of continu continuity and uh, indivisibles, and the indivisibles that seem to be the elements of the continuum. And uh, labyrinth, or uh, a quick translation of this Leibniz quote here, there are two famous labyrinths in which our reason often gets lost. One regards the great question of the free and the necessary, in particular in the production and the origin of evil. The other consists in the discussion of continuity and of the indivisibles which seem to be its elements, a discussion which must involve the consideration of the infinite. The first labyrinth embarrasses all of humanity, the other bothers only the philosophers. Right. So the second problem is characterizing the quote as that of the discussion of continuity. The problem that it alludes to arises from two theses that seem very plausible at first. One, physical, const physical holes are constituted by parts, and two, geometrical extension can always be further divided. Under these assumptions, it seems like there can be no simple parts for extended bodies to be constituted by. And then um, an earlier fragment of Leibniz um, alludes that mathematical and especially geometrical considerations will be the only way out of the second labyrinth. Um, also, that solving the problem of the continuum will be important for metaphysics. For the threat through the labyrinth of the compositum, of the composition of the continuum, and further of the biggest and the smallest, and of the indescribable and the infinite can be provided by geometry alone, but nobody will come to a solid metaphysics who has not gone through it. So this is Leibniz saying, this problem of the, the second labyrinth is an important question and important for metaphysics, even though it might not seem as pertinent to everybody's everyday concerns. Right. And this, Labyrinth remains uh, at least a common expression in uh, 18th century rationalists and Levitians, and though it's maybe debatable whether it's exactly the same problem as in, as in Leibniz. For example, Du Chatelet speaks of this labyrinth, and she says that, I'll translate the French here, the majority of philosophers, having confounded this abstraction of our mind with the physical body, wanted to provide, to prove the infinite, infinite divisibility of matter through the arguments of the geometers about the divisibility of lines that is taken to infinity. 
which has given occasion to that famous labyrinth of the divisibility of the continuum, which has so embarrassed the philosophers. But they would have been spared all difficulties which that divisibility entails if they had taken care never to apply arguments about the, the divisibility of, of the geometrical body to natural and physical bodies. So, I think this shows that the labyrinth of the continuum for the Châtelet is a problem that has, has its roots in the infinite divisibility of geometrical bodies, and that their solution is, at the face of it at least, to deny that one needs to refrain, to deny that one needs to refrain from applying, to affirm that one needs to refrain from denying, what, um, that one not, does not need to apply all the reasonings or arguments about geometrical entities to physical entities, so to bodies. And I would also argue that this is recognizably the same problem as in Latin's in the theodicy, and even makes maybe uh, allusions to the wording in, in this phrasing of having embarrassed the philosophers. But it's not clear that this that the solution of making a clear cut between geometry and physics is one that Leibniz would have accepted. Or rather, I think it's kind of obvious that it's something that Leibniz would not have accepted. What I want to find out in this talk is how Duchatel's view of physical and geometrical continuum relates to those of Leibniz and Wolf, and whether it is helpful in um, resolving the issues, especially of the constitution of the continuum. And I want to do that, as I said, by starting out from the critiques of a general monodologist view brought forward by the famous mathematician Leonard Ariel. And I'll start with one criticism that Euler brings forward against precisely this, this distinction between geometrical and physical extension. And what uh, Euler says in uh, the seventh letter to German princes is <coughs> basically that the, the strict distinction between geometrical and physical extension cannot be made because if that were so, still Geometrical extension would be an abstract notion of which physical extension is an instance. And we cannot understand this relation except if all the reasonings we can apply to geometrical extension also apply to physical extensions. He writes, if divisibility in infinitum is a property of extension in general, it must of necessity likewise belong to all individual extended beings. Um, I think that this does not actually um, show that either of the two sides is right immediately because we can uh, make, um, well, Euler is clearly right that if there's, there's the same notion of extension in both, both sides, then we'll have to apply uh, the same kind of extension to both. But um, it's not clear but what's at issue here is clearly whether it's relevant for where this makes the visibility and infinitum for physical bodies in any relative relevant sense that uh, is an issue for this labyrinth of the continuum. So maybe there's still a way for the Châtelet to, to make this divisibility sensible. We'll just have to look at how Jacques Dijon does it. Right, so um, put that distinction argument out, out of the way for the moment. Right, so I'll start with how uh, Euler characterizes 
the monergist view. He has this, um, so in these letters, he gives um, a general exposition of physics that he, um, of his pattern. This is generally, I guess, Newtonian natural philosophy, as he sees it. And there's discussion of motion, motion theory, there's discussions of optics and acoustics, but Erler often also addresses more philosophical topics like the relation of body and soul, or basic epistemology or logic. His uh, main opponents are Leibnizian philosophers, which he calls monadists. And uh, one of the points that he criticizes most fervently in them is their view on the continuum. Erler's own position is that there are no indivisible parts underlying the continuum, but rather that the physical continuum is divisible in a gentle. Um, and this is, of course, with, with Aristotle's position, but also with Descartes' position. Okay. So, how does he uh, characterize monads? As he puts it, monads are what one arrives at. The monadists say that monads are what one arrives at after this division comes to an end. He seems to even imply that there's only a certain finite number of steps involved. And after that, the further parts no longer have any expansion. And even the, the resulting monads seem to be uh, not spiritual entities, but rather like geometrical points still characterized in the geometrical continuum, but without extension. And I look clearly think that this is an untenable system, but why is it? Um, he has multiple arguments against the monarchists, but I think the, one of the best ones, or the most un understandable ones, is one where he says, um, a general monadist system runs into one of two untenable options. On the one side, they can assume these unextended particles that um, he just characterized, or they can um, deny that there is extension at all. Hmm. He says, I like the quote. The partisans of the system are, are not agreed as to this point of how extended bodies are constituted, so that some allege that monads are actual parts of bodies, and that after having divided the body as far as possible, you then arrive at the monads as constituted. Others absolutely deny that monads can be considered as constituent parts of bodies. According to them, the bodies contain only the sufficient reason. What is it then, you will ask, that touches in this case? if it is not the monads which compose the hand and the body. The answer must be that two nothings touch each other, or rather it must be denied that there is real contact. It is the mere illusion, destitute of all foundation. They are under the necessity of affirming the same thing of all bodies, which, which according to these philosophers are only phantoms formed by the imagination. So these are the two very unattractive options that uh, follow from monadism according to Euler. On the one hand, um, unextended extension, uh, geometrical points that somehow uh, form uh, extended bodies, and that's in a finite number of steps. Or on the other hand, the denial of something that is very obvious, namely the reality of extension at all. I mean, that, this, the language is so strong that bodies themselves are not only not real, but have no foundation at all. And uh, the idea seems to be that if you cannot explain how you come from the unextended monads to the bodies, then there is no foundation at all. Um, and the way he talks about this, mm -hmm. the monadists, and some, some claim this, others claim this, it's not immediately clear who is the target of this critique. 
And so I tried to look at the actual positions of Leibniz, Wolf, and Chatelet on these specific points and try to find out who might be meant by this characterization or whether either might have misunderstood all three. And uh, I'll do that by, so to speak, taking the two horns of the dilemma separately. Namely, first look at whether any of these three philosophers um, might actually be saying something that is um, characterized by this first horn, namely saying that the vision is finite and they're unextended parts of the extended bodies. And then going back and taking the second horn and say, see what they say about the reality of bodies. So we'll start with the first one. Euler has a more uh, detailed argument about the unextended constitution of bodies. Now, really here is in the eighth letter. In order to render the absurdity of this existence of minimal particles more sensible, let us suppose a line of an inch long divided into a thousand parts, and that these parts are so small as to admit of no farther division. Each part, then, would no longer have any length, for if it had any, it would still be divisible. Each particle, then, would have consequently be a nothing. But if these thousand particles together constituted the length of an inch, the thousand part of an inch would, of consequence, be a nothing which is equally absurd with maintaining that the half of any quantity, whatever, is nothing. So, the generalized argument seems to be that if you claim that there are monads that make up extended things, then, must be, then there must be some smart, smallest particle that is still extended. And this smallest particle will then contain some finite number of monads. It follows that this, this smallest distance is exactly x monads long, and therefore that these, this x number of unextended monads make up an extension. Which is in a contradiction. Um, I see three ways in, in which this could be an argument that does not work, and they either, if your position is um, not correctly characterized, because they either deny that there's a smallest particle, or they deny that this smallest particle contains only a finite number of monads, or if they deny that the relationship of these unextended monads to the extended bodies is one of the parts of parts and holes. So they somehow a finite number of monads can make up the body, but not in a way there is a contradiction, as it would be if they were parts. Leibniz, I think it's clear that already in, in this horn, as uh, Joe already talked about, that Leibniz advocates not only infinite divisibility, but infinite actual division. Um, he says that, for example, in letter to Huygens, there is no, no last of the body, and I can see that a particle of matter, however small it may be, is like a whole world full of an infinity of still smaller creatures. And even more explicit in a, in a fragment, he writes that created things are actually infinite. So there is in any body an actual infinity of unextended parts. So he would be already under the first point, uh, he would deny that there is a smallest, no, in the second point, he would deny that if, even if there were a smallest part, he would say there is an uh, infinity of parts within that. Even disregarding whether he sees the relation of parts of monads to bodies as one of parts to holes. Um, we don't need to go through this argument here, I think, because it's, but um, as I understand it, 
it's based on the fact that bodies act on each other. And that uh, anybody will be affected by other bodies and from the resulting motion will be divided into further parts. Actually, uh, which invokes this principle from Descartes, I think, that actual division is affected by uh, relative motion. Anyway, so that's, that's Leibniz out of this, this part of the picture. And that's the originals. What about Wolf? Well, Wolf has uh, smallest parts of a certain kind. And here's, um, we get a, a bit of terminology. He firstly distinguishes elements of material things or atoms of nature on the one hand from material atoms on the other side. And this is from the uh, general cosmology. And it's a Latin word where he does this, those things in the most detail. He writes that the elements of natural things are utterly in indivisible. These things, elements, are simple substances. Okay, so put that to one side. Elements are just the simple substances. And one paragraph later, an atom of nature is what is indivisible in itself, and so lacks any parts into which it could be divided. But the material atom is called that which is divisible in itself, but for the division of which no causes that exist in nature are sufficient. So the elements of natural things are also the atoms of nature, and they're contrasted to the material atoms. Those are not atoms of nature, but merely atoms that cannot be divided by natural causes. In the background that maybe God could divide them. And then in a section later, he goes on to define primitive and uh, derivative uh, particles. And primitive particles are those for which no reason can be assigned of the composition except to the elements. Um, right, down here. Um, nulla composizione ratio. So we cannot find a reason for a comp composition. It's, it's a, strange way of expressing himself. But anyway, these prim primitive particles, I think, have to be identified with the material atoms. So there's uh, a further hierarchy of atoms, of which the primitive particles are lowest, but then there's still the elements of nature below them. Right. So, both in contrast to Leibniz, would say that there is a smallest extended particle. What is not obvious from these texts, at least, and not from any that I've found, is whether Wolf thinks there's an infinity of uh, elements in the atoms, in the material atoms. Both as also mentions explicitly the, the labyrinth of the continuum and presents what he thinks is, is a solution to that labyrinth. I'll read the quote first and talk about it. Commonly, people acknowledge nothing but derivative corpuscles. For this reason, they consider every corp corpuscle as if it is composed out of smaller ones, and therefore do not acknowledge any mode of composition other than through the life explica other explicable corpus. But then they fall into the labyrinth of composition and division, from which there is no way out, owing to the fact that no one ever reaches a last term in division, nor a last reason in composition. And uh, the idea here seems to be that the labyrinth of composition and division arises from the idea that physical bodies might be in infinitely divisible and so and therefore one would not be able to come to a simple substance underlying something where of uh, clear opposite lines. Because he contrasts this solution to the labyrinth 
um, with infinite division, I think it's clear that uh, here accepts a lower li limit to actual division, but not to theoretical divisibility. Because the, the lowest actual parts of division were these material atoms that are still theoretically divisible. It's still theoretical uh, parts in these atoms of nature. And but still, it's not clear whether the number of these simple substances within a material atom is finite or infinite. Okay, what about the shuttle? There, we also would say, I think, that simple beings are unextended and indivisible. She says that simple beings having no parts, none of the properties that are born of composition would be able to attain, to attain all of them. So the simple beings not being extended at all are indivisible. She would also say, in addition, that empirical and physical considerations, as we've heard before, make it likely that they are also naturally indivisible atoms. Um, we have seen above that atoms or uncuttable parts of matter cannot be admitted as long as we regard them as simple, primitive, and not irreducible, and not reducible to anything else, because it is not possible to give any sufficient reason for their existence. But as soon as we recognize that they have an origin in the simple beings, it is very well, very well possible to admit them. For it is highly possible, and experience renders it highly, highly believable, that there, there are in the universe a certain determined number of parts of matter that nature never resolves into their principle, and that remain undivided in the present constitution of this universe. And it is furthermore likely that all the bodies that compose the universe result from the composition and the mixture of these solid particles, so that we can regard them as elements endowed with shapes and with internal differences that result from their parts. So this is a very similar picture, but with different terminology, I think, than we just accounted in, in both. There are physical atoms, they are based on simple, unextended substances, and the only thing that's new right here um, is this talk of the elements as the parts of bodies. But this might be just a, um, like a slip of terminology. She goes on, her, the question is now, is there an infinity of parts in these material atoms or in the, in the natural atoms or just a finite number of parts? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that she would uh, more clearly than both acknowledge that there is only a finite number of parts in each of these atoms. But, um, this quote on, in paragraph 171 is that this, for we have seen that is proven by the principle, by the PSR, that physical extension is ultimately composed of simple beings and that consequently its divisions, even the possible ones, have real and positive limits. So the infinite, infinite divisibility of extension is at the same time a geometrical truth and a physical error. So what uh, kind of, I think that the remarkable thing is this mem postulate, this even the possible division, Divisions of these natural atoms have their limits. So even much stronger than both, she would say that these are not just uh, there's not just natural laws that make it impossible for these these atoms to be divided, but some it sounds stronger than that. Now, she continues the same paragraph. For any finite whole, for example, a foot, that is a body of the length of one foot, 
is a composite of the finite and the infinite. This foot is finite insofar as it contains only a certain number of simple beings, which I may suppose it to be divided into an infinity of parts, or rather into an unfinished quantity of parts, by considering that foot as an abstract extension. So here again, the, the, the visibility is just a geometrical fiction. She goes on to say, a few paragraphs later, that however there is a way that we can still talk about it as an infinity of parts, because the number of parts is so large that it's amount to infinity for us. But these considerations, 175, these considerations show us that the subtlety of the parts of matter is inexpressible and that there is nobody who can ever determine the number of parts of which a grain of sand is composed, since that number surpasses our imagination and everything that we can invent. And since reason shows us that this division has no limits, and that matter does not cease to be divisible insofar as it is matter, we may say that in relation to us, Matter is not only divisible, but divided to infinity, even though its divisions really have limits. For these limits are so remote that they extend to infinity for us, because infinity for us is a quantity that no number can express. So it is kind of a, a compromise between what we might call a, a Euler's infinite divisibility, infinite division, I guess Euler's infinite divisibility, Leibniz's infinite division, and um, this uh, hierarchy of parts in, in both. But it seems to me that the only conclusion I can draw is that Euler's argument about how an inch is composed applies here. Because we actually have a given quantity, a given extension that is composed of a finite number of non-extended parts. Um, I guess to note the only way out, it would be what I call point number three above, namely if we understand the relation of these simple beings to the extension as a, a relation that is not that of parts and holes. And so we get to the second horn of, uh, of Euler's argument claims that the monists are forced to claim that contact and extended bodies are a mere, a mere illusion destitute of all such foundation. The orthodox Lemitzian way out of this is of course to say that um, no, uh, they're not forced to do that. We may admit that extension and matter are phenomena, but they are phenomena found with a real foundation with a foundation in gravity. And here's the Leibniz quote for that from a letter to the Boulder. Accurately speaking, matter is not composed of constitutive unities, but results from them. Since matter, or extended mass, is nothing but a phenomenon founded in things, like a rainbow or maxon, and all reality belongs only to unities. Substantial unities, however, are not parts but foundations of phenomena. And this is talk that both each other and both adopt. And I would, I would say that they place slightly different emphasis, uh, but I don't find their positions to be very different in the end. So there's a quote from the institutions. And so, if you were able to see these things distinctly, all that composes extension, that appearance of extension that seems so obvious to us would disappear and our soul would have perceptions only of simple beings existing outside one another. Just as if you were to distinguish all the little portions of matter moving in different ways that compose a portrait. That portrait, which is a phenomenon, would disappear for us. It looks like a strong idealism about extension. So the extension of bodies gets all its reality 
from a feature of our perceptual apparatus. And this quote, please. And that's the fruit bowl. Extension and continuity are phenomena. We therefore add this proposition. Mm. So the, I would say that the, the paragraph is entitled Extension and Continuity are Phenomena. And then he asks he asks to explain why this is not an idealism. We therefore add this proposition so that it will become apparent in what sense it may be in a must be admitted that extension and continuity are phenomena, so that there can be no suspicion of idealism, because the idealists use another sense of phenomena to denote that which only, which only appears to exist, but has no reality outside, outside, outside of the mind. So it's clear that Wolf also is uh, not trying to say that uh, extension, extended bodies are just phenomena. But I think that the real, um, real important point for them is to show how extension can be founded by uh, simple beings. And they have a very similar argument, again, that I call extension from difference. <clears throat> It is also through this dissimilarity, the dissimilarity between the simple beings, that it is possible to understand how non-extended beings can form extended beings. And now the sufficient reason of the extension of matter is found in the simple beings. For the elements exist necessarily outside one another, since one can never be the other. And since they are all united and linked to one another, as we have just seen, there results a compilation of multiple diverse beings that all exist outside one another and which are, are one whole in virtue of their connection. But I have shown that we cannot represent extension to ourselves in any way other than as a compilation of diverse coexisting things that exist outside one another. And so the Leibnizians conclude that aggregate of simple beings must be extended. So I, I put compilation for um, assemblage here. Yeah. And it's a very vague word that says not much more, I think, than this united but linked. Yeah. And the argument is more or less that I think, yeah, as it appears here, the argument seems to be just that simple beings are different, each, any one from any other. Therefore, they cannot be, therefore they're not identical. Because they're different, they must be outside one another. And then different beings that are linked but outside another, by a feature of our perception, we perceive as extended bodies. And this is all that there is to um, bodies found in extension. And this is a very similar argument as Wolf makes. <clears throat> uh, Wolf's argument is, I think, more elaborate, but in the end makes a similar point. He starts out by distinguishing xenonic points from, um, from simple beings. And by zonic, zonic point, he basically just means mathematical or geometrical points. He says that a zonic point is a simple being that, besides lacking parts, admits of no other in intrinsic determination. In other words, it is a minimum in uniform extension that has no parts at all. So this is what um, Euler says the monotists are forced to admit, namely just unextended points with no other properties that uh, magically creates extension. But uh, Euler contrasts this to the individual elements, as he says in paragraph uh, 90, 195, the individual elements are dissimilar. In other words, there is no simple substance that is numbered among the elements and is similar to another in the same number. So 
right? Just as we saw, we shall let's say this is um, there pointwise is similar. For the elements of material things are dissimilar from each other. And so one is distinct from the other. Therefore, each exists outside one of the other, or all of them, all of them outside one another. So more explicitly the same argument that we have difference and therefore we have externality. And then from this is what the, the argument for extension follows from, because he writes in paragraph 221, the aggregates of the elements are extended. For when elements are aggregated, they exist outside one another and are united with one another. Therefore, since each is dissimilar from the other, those properties by which they must be distinguished from each other are diverse, and consequently, they themselves are diverse as well. Therefore, since that in which diverse things, that is, things out existing outside one another, are united, must be extended, the aggregates of the elements are extended. And uh, I think the whole point comes in the last sentence, that in which diverse things existing outside one another are united, must be extended. And it's, uh, so it's less clear whether this is meant epistemologically or metaphysically in some way. So the idea is still that if you, um, the simple substances are not simple geometrical points because they have these additional differences and that is what enables us to prove extension. Does this work? I'm not sure. I, uh, I think if this is really the only argument provided, then um, it probably doesn't not work. And um, Derisi has talked about this with regards to Wolf and other Leibnizians, not with uh, regards to Schaffe um, in particular. But um, I agree, I think, with him that there's this jump from qualitative difference to externality and then from externality to continuity. <laughs> right. um, maybe there's a way to uh, articulate this in an epistemological way, but uh, if it's just supposed to be a logical argument that we know they have these differences, therefore we know they have extension, then I, can, I cannot see how it follows. Um, might there be a way to add to the argument by um, spelling out what exactly the differences between the simple substances are, namely that maybe they they differ by active and passive forces or by causal relations? Maybe, but I haven't. Maybe I just don't know enough about this text, but I don't know how it would work. Or that is that it is spelled out. Um, does it make a difference in the strength of arguments uh, contrasting Leibniz on the one hand and the Chatelet and both on the other versus Euler? Maybe. I guess the two most of the most salient differences here would be that the those latter monadists, simple beings, uh, don't have perceptions. And as we talked about, there's only a finite number of them uh, within each atom. I think one of the, one of the interesting interpretations of how Leibniz sees the uh, constitution of the continuum uses the representative perceptions of each monast, each monad of every other monad, right? So that is a way that's clearly close to somebody who does not accept perceptions of monads. So one way to read this would uh, be to say that um, to reconstruct 
how metaphysically the continuum is constituted by simple beings does exactly what you lose when you um, take this step of denying that the simple beings have perceptions. That's the price you pay. Because there's no way of articula articulating anymore how relations of situations or relations of ex externality arise from internal differences of the moment. But maybe just in some other way. <coughs> um, does the infinite division, division make any difference in the end? does insofar as it's uh, the fact that Duchatelet in, in particular accepts a finite number of atoms, of, of simple beings and atoms, um, opens her up to various arguments. But, um, it wouldn't matter if there was another way of articulating the reality of extension. And that's all I have.